everybody's kind of filtering in. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're super excited about this program. So we're just going to get everybody a minute to, to join us and say hi. And I encourage you to turn your cameras on. We've got a, a more intimate group and you know how casual the Sage Council is. We want this to be really interactive and fun and, um, and just learn together this morning. Hi, Val. Um, Got no, that. I want to wave to everybody too. Hi. I know, right? We all are so missing seeing each other. It's just, we were just talking about that when we were doing um, kind of our sound check and, and uh, as we, uh, as we get everyone locked and loaded, it looks like we're at about 23 people already. So, um, and this is really fun because we've got everything covered coast to coast, right? We've got people on the, on the West coast and people on the East coast. And so we're, we've got, coast. Yeah, bring it. I love it. Um, I guess we're, we're pretty close. I'm going to, I'm going to just kick this thing off. So um, this morning we have such a treat, honestly, um, three of my favorite brilliant minds in our industry have come together to, uh, to share what they've done. Um, you know, we all know that life is so different over the last year and always changing. Something gets thrown at you almost every day. Um, and our speakers this morning have truly championed um, the America at Home study. And they're here today to share with us um, not only, um, you know, what's changed because we're all experiencing it, but take a look at how different generations are dealing with the change and what their new expectations are. So thank you for joining us this morning. Again, we're thanking all of our sponsors as well. Um, you, you guys, this wouldn't happen without you. Um, so on behalf of the Board of SAGE, I appreciate you. We all appreciate you. And thanks for, for being here this morning. I'm going to jump right into it because I know we've got a little bit of time. Um, I, allow me to introduce our panel this morning. Terry Slavic siyuki the principal of TST Inc. Nancy Keenan, president of the Dolan Group. And Elena Money Garman, CEO of Garmin and Fresh Paint. Ladies, it's all you. All right. Thanks, G. Let me share the screen here so people can see. So good morning, everybody. I miss you all. This is nothing but sheer torture to see all these friendly faces. And I'm sitting here behind a screen when I just want to mush you and smush you all. So anyway, with that as a start off, we'll, we'll go from there. So thank you for spending time with us this morning. I'm super, super excited. As I think many of you know, Nancy and myself partnered with another uh, consumer strategist Belinda Sward to develop and fund two waves of research called the American Home Study, once in April, then again in October. And our purpose was really, we were sort of all kind of sitting at home like you all were. And I was growing extremely frustrated because no one was talking about life from home and the impact that COVID would have on that. So we were hearing about things like small business impacts, hospitality impacts, the impacts on travel and tourism. And yet all of America, for the most part, was under some kind of stay at home order and nobody was talking about the impact that COVID would have on home and community, which is of course near and dear to all of our hearts. So I reached out to Nancy and to Belinda and they said yes, and we developed the study, which has been really fantastic and some interesting work. And we've developed some new friendships and some new opportunities along the way. Elena, and the team at Garmin Homes also joined in our efforts, which is awesome because, you know, now we have a home builder partner who, as Nancy is famous for saying, is really putting the D in the R&D. It's one thing to do the research, you know, and get the insights and have a study sit in a nice binder on your shelf, but it's really another to actually roll up your sleeves, get into some workshops and design charrettes with, I think, the most creative home builder, certainly that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. Um, and, and actually say, how might we really build this thing and build a home based on these insights? So it's awesome to be able to talk with you about it today. We're gonna make this really casual. Um, Gina and team asked us to go through some of the insights by generation. We know that your primary focus is boomers, but we're gonna talk about all three generations and I'll kind of level set by starting off with some of the initial data and then we'll go from there. So let me just advance the slides. Hopefully this works. Okay, come on. <laughs> what is going on? Hold on. There we go. All right. So the first question we asked both in April and October was what does home mean to you in light of COVID? And you've probably heard us say this before in both waves of our study, safety or a safe place was primary was number one followed by comfort and family. We added a few more factors in the second wave of the study, but one thing I wanna draw your attention to is the increasing importance of home 
noted in, in the factors of freedom, simplicity, and financial stability. So in October, all three of those factors increased in importance when people defined what home meant to them. We also asked what changes they have made um, in their home as a result of COVID. And then in the second wave, we asked what changes they expect to continue after life with COVID is no longer a thing. And just to level set again, the data set in April was a nationwide survey of about 3,000 people. In October, it was almost 4,000 people. So 3,935 individuals who were ages 18, pardon me, 25 to 74 with household income of 50,000 a year plus. There was no uh, requirement to have to be in the market for a home because we really wanted to test both homeowners and renters and see the differences in perceptions with those two groups. So we have some insights there as well. But here you see all of the changes people made in their home, they expect to continue. And this was important to us to understand because you know, there's all this conversation about, well, is this just a point in time or is this, you know, really long-term sort of stay saying changes, sticky changes. And what this data shows us is we really are quite confident that most of these things will stick. Certainly, as I said at the beginning, we're all really excited and happy to get back to reality and to what is some kind of a new normal. But I think this, the impact of this pandemic on how we think about space and home and community is lasting. Um, we also asked people what's important in their home and, and what's missing in their home and what they're willing to pay for in a new home. And what's important to note here in this slide is the blue data is April, the kind of peach or orange data is October. And what was important in April is still important today. So again, you know, not a big giant shift. We didn't go through this sort of crisis for six or seven months and then just go, awesome, life is great. There, we have now spent more time in our homes and our communities, and we've decided that our things are missing and things aren't working the way that we want them to. So technology upgrades, a better equipped kitchen, germ-resistant countertops and flooring, and you can see all the different data points across the way. This was the macro study. Um, we're going to go into some of the details by generation in a moment. So I always like to think about it from the customer's point of view first, right? It's really easy in our industry to start to think about, well, I've got this piece of land and it's this, you know, X feet by Y feet, and I'm going to build, you know, a square a home of this, this square footage. And it's going to be, you know, 2,500 square feet or 3,200 square feet or whatever. It's easy to think about the box, but I like to step back and start with the customer first and ask ourselves, what are their pain points in their life that our product and our services can help alleviate? And what are the gains they're looking for that we can help them kind of amplify or make more of? So today we're going to talk about the pain points. And as we go through this, Nancy's going to share some design solutions from the architect's point of view. And then Elaine is going to chime in and talk about, whoa, what does this look like and feel like as a home builder? And we encourage you to you know, send us notes, type comments in the chat, questions in the chat. We'll try to get to them as we go really randomly as if this were a conversation. And we were enjoying a lovely, lovely cup of coffee together in some great room with nice big windows and a view. So anyway, pain points for millennials. They're really focused on safety, function, productivity, and keeping busy. So this is the group of all of the generations. And I, I, I've got this by mind-based segments, which are the Kantar uh, different consumer segments that break the generations even into more finer grain groups. But we're going to talk for the millennials and, and Gen X at the macro generational level. So for the millennial generation, we know they're not all the same, but in general, this was the group that was disinfecting things more, definitely upgrading technology, really interested in more than one home office or soundproofing a home office or adding doors. Uh, this was the group that was the most likely to build a home gym in their garage, really increase and want better technology, as I said a moment ago, and, and focused on the adaptability of spaces even to the point of asking for and saying they're willing to pay for movable walls, which we know poses some issues for home builders. So Nancy, take it away. Good morning, everybody. It really is great to see everybody. So many familiar faces. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been as architects, you know, I think a lot of us have been asked by our home builder clients to, you know, start making changes to our design, start adapting. But with the study data in front of us, it really tells us what's important to the consumer and what are the things that we can really start focusing on. Um, when we look at the middle 
um, piece there with the bathroom, we can start right away. The low hanging fruit is make these rooms work more than one way. Take a guest bathroom and make it accessible through the laundry space. And you can have a healthcare provider come home, go straight into the bathroom and wash up and do more than one thing with that low hanging fruit, those bathrooms and make them work hard. The other thing that's easy to do is find the niches. Go in under the stairs. There's a place where you can have a kid working and studying um, when they're homeschooling while you're in the family's in the great room or you're in the kitchen. And then the part that starts to scare Elena <laughs> is when we get into make, <laughs> make those bedrooms work harder too. Think of all the things that millennials need to do. They've got a maybe a smaller house, a couple of secondary bedrooms. What are all the different ways you can make those bedrooms work? The movable walls team up with a vendor. The vendors are willing to come in and help you work with these kinds of solutions and go straight to your client with them. But think about ways, and maybe Elena can speak to this more with the concept home of your secondary bedrooms. What about that closet? Does it really need to be built in or is there something else you can do there? Yeah, I love this slide, Nancy, and you're right. That those movable walls terrify me. But yeah. I love the idea of a vendor teaming up with a vendor because um, obviously I don't want to mess it up. But um, we can go back just that one slide to, to Nancy's oh, sorry. slide. Sorry. That's okay. There we go. <laughs> or forward, I think. Yeah. But I love what you're saying because what we try to do is mine the space we already have, mine the square footage for more functions than we'd previously imagined for it. So we're trying to hit those pain points we're talking about, like, is there a space where we can sneak in that's like the desk under the stairs? And, and that may be um, a good command center, but like a home office for the things, all the things you run out of your home. But then do you need another space that's sort of like closet size where you can have a Zoom call, focus on your work, but also be accessible to for homeschooling or, um, you know, all the other things that happen inside your house, which... For me, I have homeschooling right now, so we're just constantly we're just constantly in the kitchen, cleaning it, or preparing food, or planning the next meal. Um, so these are great, great spaces to reimagine the space. All the space is working harder, and then what does that look like in the floor plan? How do we reflect that flexibility without building something, without building furniture? Like my my boundary is, I don't want to build furniture. So that those beds would count for me as furniture, but somebody else can build them. <laughs> So Elena, I'd love you to share um, a moment because you, the, from the fresh paint line of Garmin, for sure, you definitely build homes that are really appealing to this generation, to the millennial group and to a lot of first time buyers mm -hmm. um, and buyers who are stretching to get into their home. And I know that at the beginning of the pandemic, when we first talked, you did some initial research with your own home buying customers to find out things they had changed and pain points they were experiencing. Can you share some of that with the group too as well? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for that for the prompt they we reached out to our buyers to find out sort of okay how is the home performing because we i was a little nervous it's like okay the we're like really testing the pressure points of our homes and i hope they're performing for our buyers and so we really dug in um fresh paint attracts a lot of millennials and a lot of boomers actually because um the curated whole home design package makes a simpler process for a millennial buyer it's a concierge for a boomer who's done it before and doesn't want to pick out grout. So those, those two ends of the spectrum kind of um, on similar, but the places that they're, they were using the most were um, they were putting a gate in the front porch. So they had an outdoor space because a lot of millennials were liking to work out and then come inside having multiple places to work. And um, that also keeps kids and dogs where they should be. Um, and it creates a natural barrier for visitors to be part of the outside safe. And then um, certainly kitchens were, um, people were spending a ton of time in their kitchens and, and we were getting a lot of, a lot more insight on how to make those spaces function better for them and how those spaces can transition from daytime work and school to nighttime just being home. And we'll, we'll talk, I'll talk about that later as, as it relates to the concept home and some of the things we're doing with the kitchen. Cool, that's great, thanks. And one of the things that I also remember you sharing and at the time I thought, well, that's such an obvious and it's so simple. And maybe it, you know that's worth sharing this morning because some of these things, some of these design ad adaptations don't have to be onerous and overwhelming. They can just be thoughtful and what I kind of call on purpose. And one of the things was you know, adding more outlets 
and USB charging stations in the wall at eye level, right? So don't make me have to duck down and move furniture and pull stuff out to get my little tiny cord to plug in. But right. think about, right? Think about me working from home and needing to make the space function better for my all my all my needs all day long. So that was a, a real simple thing to me that seemed like an obvious. Because we don't work in one space. We work all over our homes. Right. And I think that ties back into Elena talking about the niches becoming the command center, starting to yeah. think about where is that router and that internet connection going to sit that gets the most coverage over the whole house and gives people the opportunity to plug in their smart home. And, you know, we aren't often placing that in the house, but we could, we could think about it where it has the least amount of blockage for Wi-Fi, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I know all of the years I spent working with architects and interior designers creating welcome centers or discovery spaces or cafe spaces. We sat and looked not only at the lighting plan, but we sat and looked at the electrical plan and said, well, where does this outlet have to go? Because we're actually putting a display on that wall. So it can't go there. So the intentionality we, we bring to that, I think could be something that is more functional in the home going forward as well. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. So the Gen X group, um, this is the sandwich generation. Elena and I are both firmly in this, in this demographic, in this generation, if you will. And for this group, COVID really brought up the need for life as a balancing act and also finding space. So this is the generation that in many cases has kids in different ages of school from elementary up to high school. And it may also, and Elena, I hope you'll speak to this in a moment, may also have parents living in the home with you at the same time. So while you're schooling and working and caring for a parent from home, I mean, life got a little nutty, right? So, so in our data, in our survey data, this was the group that really more than all was using rooms for combined purposes. And so what that means is they were using rooms for a bedroom for part of the day, a home office like I am here for part of the day, um, a place to school children, places to work out, that little Peloton niche, if you will. And so that was a big deal for them. And they were looking for really better room to work and better home offices. That was a huge, huge thing. This was the group that was really interested in more than one home office. It didn't have to take over a bedroom. And we'll talk about that with the concept home in a moment as well. So it was all about reorganizing to create more storage. And the important thing about kitchens, I want everyone, especially all the interior designers on the call this morning to think about this, what we heard people say over and over, and we asked these questions in a very specific way, was they wanted a better equipped kitchen for cooking, not a show kitchen, not something that just looks great. And you know that's important, certainly, but it's really about a better equipped kitchen that supports better cooking, better function throughout the day and night. Um, this was also the group that was focused on keeping their finances under control. We asked a lot of questions about health and wellness and gave them a number of different factors of wellness to think about, including financial. And of all generations, the Gen X generation, maybe not surprisingly, was the one that was really uh, more focused on financial wellness than others. Certainly millennials, we've all talked about it and written about it and heard about it for years. The qualification, the down payment issue, the student debt issue is still an issue. But when you think about a Gen X buyer, you know, late 40s, early 50s, hitting their stride, right in their peak earning years, thinking about retirement, but also thinking about still schooling their kids and getting them through college as well. Um, we also heard in a lot of the verbatims and sort of anecdotal comments that they were seeing value in spaces they hadn't used before, such as their backyard, their porch, their garage, and there was really a heightened focus on, on taking care of ourselves and being there for each other. And I'll try to remember um, one verbatim that stuck with me from wave one. It was a Gen X gentleman, a father. Um, they had two small children and he told us in his verbatim comments that how had his day changed? He said, well, I go into my wife's car in the morning. I sit in the driveway and take all my calls from my wife's car in the morning until about 10 o'clock so that my kids and my wife can sleep in. Then I come inside. We have breakfast together as a family. Um, you know, my wife then takes care of the kids and does whatever they need to do during the day. And he takes a break in the middle of the afternoon and does a workout because he can shower from home, get back in his clothes and finish off his last couple of calls for the day. But I mean, the notion of going out to your wife's car, sitting in the driveway to find a quiet spot to take your calls, to be ca careful and conscious of your family, and also to be in a space where you could work productively, that just tells us there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, that's 
it's significant. I and I I can speak from having um, two kids in high school and one kid in elementary school and a 79 year old mother in my house and a business that we have totally redone rooms in our house to reflect all the things we need to do now. But this kitchen, I mean, my kitchen has been stress tested to the limit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as, designers, we, as designers, when we hear the story about the guy in the car, all we can think is there's got to be a way to solve this in the house for that guy. Yeah. I hope we have it by now. Speaking of kitchen, we've been talking about kitchens a lot. It really feels like the kitchen is a place that we can start honing in on. We've, we've designed them a lot of different ways, a lot of different kinds of islands, and we'll lay out some pretty basic cabinetry and we've got our triangle going on. But if we really started to dig in to all the ways you can use your kitchen, I've said this a few times, Terry and Elena both heard it, I think it needs to work like a Swiss army knife. Mm -hmm. We need to make that kitchen do so many things, flex between being able to cook well, being able to have your kids schooling there. It's the hub of you know the family home. Think, you know, when I think about what it, what all can those cabinets do, how can they flex their way in and out? Um, I think of uh, places like go to Ikea and you think of all the different ways they can do things with cat with simple cabinetry or RV design. I mean, look at all the stuff they cram into an RV and, you know, start to do some of those sorts of efficiencies with a kitchen. I really feel like the kitchens must work harder and we've got to find ways to make it happen. This picture, I love this picture of the island that you've included, and this is something we're doing a version of in the the concept home because the those those um the shelves on the end, so pre COVID live pre quarantine, those would just be you know pretty right. It's just a shelf on the end, but now we're trying to find ways where the kitchen can actually empower the kids to be a little bit more independent, even younger kids, to be a lot more independent. So maybe their dishes are there. So they're, they're, they could set the table from there or um, there's places where their homework goes away so that they're mentally like arriving at home to just be not a student, but to be at home with dinner. And so all these, all these spaces have to have all this high functioning storage so you can get what you need and get in and out. But then they also need to transition and sort of disappear and go away so that you're just at home then. You know, you're not looking at your work and you're not looking at your school. And so all of these spaces, what I love is that they, they disappear, they go away. And it can be very simple. That, that image just shows you, it doesn't have to be complicated to make that happen. But just by tucking that banquette up against the, the counter, you save the space and been able to, in this case, to open up the other side to the outside to bring in light and air. And, and that's one of the things we've talked about too. And Terry and I saw in the in the study is the, the physical mental well-being and bringing light and air into every room is really important when we're spending so much time at home. For sure. Yeah, it sure is. All right, let's go to the next slide here. All right, Nancy, take it away. Yeah, this generation said they were making changes to the garage. This is, I just can't wait to get my hands on a couple of garages. <laughs> Look at what people are already doing. They're turning them into schools. They're turning them into gyms. It's their home office. They're putting hobbies there. This used to be where we parked a car, if you remember. And so do we really, as the parking, um, parking regulations are changing, this is ripe for, especially in places like California where the cost of land is so expensive, this is ripe for change. We should be really looking at all the ways, either it is, morphing the garage or does it really need to be that much garage? I've said a few times, do we have to enshrine the car? Look at how many people, how many things people could do there. <laughs> yeah, and this is an important uh, data point too, just to give everyone some context. Again, between April and October, all of the changes people made in their garages in April had continued to increase in every single way. So I think this is really, um, probably some of the most underutilized space in a home, this, and then of course the front porch and kind of outdoor seating areas, which if you think about it, that's probably the cheapest space to build because it's not HVAC space, right? So I think what would be really awesome, I, what I would love to come out of this is for builders to start to look at front porches, not as an added cost. I mean, I've had lots of conversations with builders about, you know, building it to the size that it can actually function and it supports chairs that actually really do work. 
as opposed to just the sort of dollhouse porch that's maybe six feet, but you can't really do anything with it. So if you're going to go to that extent, build it, build one that works. And it's probably one of some of the most inexpensive space to add into a home. So Elena, what, what are your thoughts on the garage? I love the garage as an, as an op opportunity to reflect more personal um, usage for the buyer. I, I, my concern, my builder hat concern would be appraisal, um, right. how, how that'll be perceived and in the space and Obviously, climate here plays a big role for us because um, it gets really hot in North Carolina in the um, summer. So you couldn't really you couldn't work out without putting yourself in danger at least one month of the year. <laughs> it would be too hot to work out. But um, we've watched a significant amount of our homeowners transition their garages into gyms over this past year, and we're very active, engaged with them on social media, and it's 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 interesting to watch them personalize this space. So. As that becomes more, um, we, we will be trailing edge on this, but as that becomes more of a wish, because we, we allow our buyers to have three wishes on their home. So these are custom options outside of our program, because about three wishes is, is the extent to which we can alter and personalize the experience without ruining it. And so if somebody were to wish for a home gym like this space in the middle, I love this. I think this is well done find space. I think you're right, Nancy. I don't think we have to enshrine the car. I think a lot of people are using this space for storage anyway. So it goes back to what Terry's saying about intentionality. I think we're being much more intentional with the space we have and the opportunity we have to reflect more purposes within the space we have and not just carry around a bunch of junk that we're not using. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, so let's move on to the boomers. So before we get into the detail on this group, I really thought it was important to kind of step back and, and I'm gonna share this through the frame of Kantar mind-based segmentation because I've worked with it for more than 10 years. I find it really, really, um, really deep and really thoughtful. And unlike some other segmentation methodologies, which you may all be familiar with like Claritas or VALS, they use what's called a like follows like methodology. So in other words, if Nancy and Terry live side by side as next door neighbors on the same street, they're gonna say we're the same segment, which clearly we're not, right? We have different, we're in different stages of our life. We, pro we probably have different values and attitudes about certain things. We definitely have different family formations. So, so that's kind of very limiting. What Kantar is able to do because of their work with the US Monitor Consumer Trends Study is they're able to use more than 45,000 different individual data points and profile each one of us based on just having our name and our hard street address. And so you could very well be a different mind-based segment than your spouse or partner who lives with you. And, and the mind-based segments are based on values, attitudes, and behaviors. So not just demographic kind of criteria. So the boomer in the, in the latest release of the mind-based segmentation tool, the boomers are divided into three different groups. And what you see on the, on the slide here is the percentage of, of each group that represents the percentage of the boomer generation overall. So in other words, 30% of the boomers are full throttles, 52% are what they call smooth sailors, and 18% are compassionate creatives. And what you'll see as well on the slide, I've included the average, the, sorry, the median age, uh, whether they have kids or not, what percentage have kids or not under the age of 18 still living at home, and their household income. So you can start to see some differences right away already. And what's important to note, take a look at the names of the segments. They really actually tell you a lot about what the segments stand for. So the full throttles are the boomer segment that's probably still working more so than their compatriots. Um, they, do, they do live life full on. Um, they're much more tech savvy, much more interested in, in sort of innovation and change. The boomers generationally overall, I will say in our data, um, was the group that made the fewest changes to their current living situation as a result of COVID. So when you look at smooth sailors, I mean, they just kind of kicked back and eased on down the road and kind of tried to get through this thing. Um, the compassionate creatives as well had sort of different approaches. So important to kind of think about when you think about boomers and you think about product design or amenity design, it, like every generation, there isn't one boomer. There isn't one 55 plus buyer. There isn't one solution. So Let's start with that and then we'll go into some of the detail. So what are the pain points? Um, just to sort of give you a context for the slide, what you'll see here are the pain points for each of the three boomer segments. And across the bottom 
um, I've shown you the, the, the level of well-being or the, I guess the criteria, the well-being criteria that's most important to these groups. So we'll get to that as we go through. So for the full throttles, really what they, what, what COVID did for them was they were the ones that really saw home as a hub, right? So they were all about better tech, energy efficiency. What you'll see here is that the full throttle, 61% of them wanted that versus 38% of the rest of the boomers. So pretty big, significant differences. This group also was all in on the work from home upgrade, right? 49% said they wanted that and would pay for it versus 24% of the rest of the boomers. Again, better equipped kitchens for cooking, 49% of this group versus 24% of the rest of the boomers. You can see some pretty significant changes. And this group was all about emotional well-being. and interestingly and notably, this is the only boomer group that was really interested in physical health and fitness as one of their top uh, sort of modicums of health. So that's pretty interesting. Let's move to the smooth sailors in the middle of the slide. Hygiene rules. This group was disinfecting things more. 64% of them said that. Also, this is the group that said, yeah, we made no changes to our home. We're good. We hunkered down. So 63% of the smooth sailors versus 46% of the rest of the boomers made no changes to their home. This was the group, the large, the group that in the largest numbers made no changes. Uh, and also in terms of what they were doing more of, relaxing at home, 69% versus 60. So just like chilling in for the long term, hunkering down, making do. Uh, they were concerned about financial well-being first and foremost, and then emotional well-being. So let's move to the third boomer group, which is the compassionate creatives. They, were, they, can, they can be kind of coined as thinking about life during COVID as making do. Again, no change is made, but 55% of them versus 63% of the smooth sailor. So they still didn't make changes in the same way that others did, but not to the same extent. They spent more time cooking and baking, 57% versus 51% of the rest of the boomers. These are the groups like my neighbors next door, Marty and Sharon, that would bring over you know, sourdough bread and homemade spaghetti sauce. And when we had our, we still have our Thursday night, seven o'clock check-in with all of our homes around us on our little cul-de-sac. And they're all about what can they do for each other? Just wonderful, caring, kind group. Um, this group was also the one that was most inclined to pay for sanitized garbage and recycling areas. So you start to see the importance of hygiene moving from inside the home to outside the home as well. And again, you can see the percentage differences there versus the rest of the boomers. And then in terms of their focus on wellness, emotional well-being was first, very much about taking care of others, very much about we versus me, very much about their greater community at large. And then um, financial well-being was their next uh, area of concern. Nancy, over to you. Well, a couple of people mentioned in the chat, and how surprised they are the number of kids living at home with the boomers, or in my case, they came back. <laughs> and they're at home again because it's a lot more comfortable than the apartment they were in. So, you know, I think that does start to influence how boomers do look as if they are buying a new home, they might be the ones most likely to want a dedicated room for a home office, but they still want the flexibility. They still want to be able to convert that room back to a guest room. They want to be able to do something else or different with it. They see a future where the kids may not be there with them all the time. So this speaks again to the, the some of the flexible furniture pieces. I'm going to give a shout out to um, one of the vendors we've talked with a couple of times is, and I think others are doing this, is California Closets, for instance, is retooling their entire line to do this sort of thing. And so other vendors are doing the same. They're really looking at this as an opportunity, but even the simple things like converting a Murphy bed into a guest bed or into a home office the rest of the time. This is where the boomers want to focus. They want those rooms to, to work and they have generally a house that has enough space in it to do that, to dedicate an office. I love the image on the left. I love the bed that slides out and slides back because I know during the design charrette and the, and the sort of planning inspiration workshops, we spent a lot of time talking about like how much square footage in a home do we dedicate to bedrooms that we sleep in for, you know, six to eight, if we're lucky hours a night, but what about all the rest of the time? So I think that's just a genius image that shows some new ways to think about it. I love oversize. that image too. It doesn't yeah. scare me. <laughs> you, you oversize a secondary bedroom for this very purpose, knowing you're going to repurpose it a couple of different ways. Yeah. It's really interesting as builders because we used to get, when we would do like a flex space, 
people would come in the front of the home. So it could be a dining room or an office or something like that. People would come in and, and ding us for it. Like, well, what am I supposed to do here? Like we had to prompt more mm -hmm. and now we need the flexible space, but then we also do need to prompt, like it can be, you know, A, B, C, or D have it all these different, we have to have that all figured out so that they can identify their life and their greatest need of like, oh, I need that version because I need it to convert to accommodate people here, but then go back to this. And that's, yep. that's really where I think we're getting the benefit of becoming better mm. after the quarantine, becoming more intuitive and more prescriptive, but also in very intentional ways of like reflecting the life that's inside your home because it, it's changing. Just like Nancy said, people are coming back. You know, all my, my nieces and nephews who graduated from college, they're back with my sisters. And my sisters are sort of like 64, 65. So they're, they're boomer Gen X, you know, uh, fence sitters, but all their kids are back and they're, they're really hitting this head on and their homes are not reflecting what they need them to do. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. I want to just, again, just t touch on and build on what you said about the, the sort of flex space of old, if you will. And yeah, you know, we'll remember this from some of the, um, the tours that she and I did back in the day around some of Newland's communities across the country. And I remember walking into a home actually up into Holly in the Pacific Northwest with a, doing an ethnography tour with a home shopper. And, and it was the typical, beautiful, you walk in the front door and to, to the left was this small, not big enough to be a bedroom, no closet, so it couldn't be a bedroom, just a square room with a big window to the street, which was lovely, and then glass French doors. And the shopper that I was with looked at me and said, well, what am I supposed to do with that space? Like, do I put a chair in it and a bookshelf? If my kid played the piano, I could put a piano there, but it was kind of this tweener space. The windows made, and they went on and said, I can't put an office there because it'll be messy and it's right inside the front door. I don't want people to see that. So I think sometimes we default to what looks great inside the home from the kind of street appeal or inside the front door appeal. But I, I want to challenge everyone to think from the, from the inside out, from the home buyer perspective, inside out, and how will they feel about that space and does it work for how they live? Yeah. So can I just add a little something? We've yeah. seen some real shifts at Thomas James Homes in you know, this mentality where we were building houses so our parents could, could be taken care of by us. That whole next gen suite has done a complete 180. Like that space now is, is for these kids that are coming home. And our division president is a perfect example in Southern California. Doug's got four adult kids. Three of them are married. One of them has the first grandkid. And because they all felt so unsafe, they moved home. They're all living together again as this like giant family. Um, of course, poor Doug is like at the office every day <laughs> instead of staying at home. But, but I mean, it's an interesting concept when you think about how we all drove that next gen suite in this effort. Like I'm gonna you know, create this great place for my parents to feel safe to come back and live with me so I can take care of them. And now it's completely fit, flipped, right? Mom and dad got the room. So that space has turned into the kids, you know, come back zone. That's so true. Yeah, neighbor on my street had both of his adult kids come home for a number of months. And, and, and you know, there's a positive side of that too. A lot of families say, I've, I've loved it. I've really enjoyed the gift of that time with my kids I wouldn't have otherwise had. Yeah. But yeah, the space has to Absolutely. work. Absolutely. All right. Nancy. Well, that brings us to those outdoor spaces. <laughs> this, is, this is feeding right into that idea of now you have the boomers have more people back in the house again. You really, you're craving the light, you're craving the air and that outdoor space can be flexible too. I don't know, I was, I, how many times we've had, we have our team meetings um, internally on MS Teams. And when we see, you can see all these people on the screen, at least three or four of them are sitting out on the back patio. One of our designers actually designed himself a desk outside that's where they put their herb garden in, but it's also his desk during the day. And he says, now he has to get there before his wife does to see who gets to the outdoor desk first. So <laughs> I think there's, you know, especially in our climate in Southern California, we're able to do that. We're able to take those, those rooms and turn them into functional spaces. And so it's, you know, the front porch we've talked about, um, Elena mentioned people are putting gates on their front porch and it's a great way, you know, now we can make those front porches as usable as all of us architects ever wanted them to be. They're not just to talk to your neighbors. You can actually go hang out there during the day. 
Yeah, that's true. I'm so glad we were thinking, of, we build inside master plan communities a lot. And so we were sort of, we were including private outdoor spaces as a sort of a gift to the homeowner in terms of having a space. Cause like front door space, front porch space is almost public space, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, people walk by, you converse there, but like we were trying to find the, the square footage in the box for a, just an area, just for the owners to have a moment that was outside that wasn't connected to where they be seen by neighbors because they're six feet apart. Um, so we were we were doing this early enough just by because of the density, but those spaces have become so important for people to, as escape, as um, just being outside or being able to take a call from outside and use it as a workspace, but private outdoor spaces, and it doesn't need to be big. It can be big enough for two chairs and, and covered, and that that really uh, infuses a luxury and escape in inside our homes, and that space can really transition. Yeah, that's a great point, Elena, and I'll just share two data points, not related to this boomer demographic or generation, but from our study that makes this point, I think, even more. So in April, when we asked renters, did COVID make them more or less inclined to now want to become a homeowner? In April, 46% said more inclined. They wanted to now buy a home. In October, even despite the economic meltdown and all of the trauma that we've all been through, that increased to 50%. So safe to say that today, one in two renters across all demographics because of COVID now wants to become a homeowner to have more control over their environment. So given that, and we know that the renter population in some cases may have a diff more difficult time qualifying to buy a home, we asked them also a follow-up question and we said, what trade-offs are you willing to make to be able to be better positioned or better able to purchase a home? The number one trade-off, number one, like off the charts before anything else, was they were all willing to give up a yard, like a full private yard, if they had some access to private outdoor space by way of a, when we called it, a patio, a porch, a balcony, or a deck. So I love that because I know, Nancy, you've been working with builders for years and, and most architects and builders have all been wrestling with the question, especially in Southern California, the notion of attainability and affordability. So I think we can sort of stop apologizing based on our study anyway, for, for not having yards but we need to get really serious about how we design and program this private, smaller outdoor space. Do you have anything to add to that, Nancy? Well, and I'm, I'm also shifting to thinking about in multifamily, a lot of the attainability, the, the first thing that goes is the deck. Yeah. And what they, what we'll be able to go back to our clients and say, that's the one, that's the piece you need to keep. We need to keep some access to the outdoors. People also were willing to trade off the yard for access to walkability. And so in our communities for years, we've talked about trails, open space, all of that. If we're able to condense the density and create more open space, we have the data that says folks will make that trade off. They'd like to have the walkability too. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and this is our last image before we'll open it up for hopefully some really good conversation. So this is a really fun one. Elena, Nancy, take it away. So this one, this one goes back to what Gina was saying about the, the next gen suite or the guest suite. And I think Elena will be able to talk about that with the parent living at home. And then we started to really explore this idea if, if disinfecting, sanitizing, feeling safe is so important, it's stuck. That was one of the things that there was speculation that people wouldn't feel that way once the pandemic is gone, but it's really sticking. And, and we're all thinking about how we make, this may stick with us for some time. You think about the different ways you enter your home. There's the ways that the guests come in or the, the guest that's staying with you comes in the door. And then there's the way the family comes in the door. And so the family has all the kids and the dogs and the stuff. And we've been doing key drop zones, but in reality, we're dropping way more than keys when you come in the door. And so, so you need, you need a place to drop it all. And you've got, you know, the kids are dropping the backpacks and the muddy shoes and, you know, all these things that happen on a, on a family's way in from either the garage or the backyard that we can start to think about that more seriously and wash your hands before you go in the house, that kind of stuff. And then the front door, um, we've had a lot of fun hearkening back to vestibules and the idea 
of, you know, the porch is a transition zone, but then the entry is a vestibule and you have people that maybe you're, are coming to the house to, you know, transfer packages or bring something to you and you may bring them to a certain point, but you really are thinking about what happens beyond this zone and um, the idea of actually putting in a transparent door as a part of that vestibule or a powder adjacent. So folks coming in, guests coming over can do their own drop zone and wash their hands before they come in the house. And then the adjacency of that to that next gen suite and the possibility of it having its own porch and private outdoor space. So Elena, I know you have, you have a lot of ex personal experience about how that might work for you and your family and in the concept home. I, it, I do, just because I got to live out all my fantasies about what I wish my home had um, <laughs> right now that it doesn't because my mom's suite, my mom has just the, a first floor bathroom that's also been the powder room. You know, we don't have a powder room. We have her bathroom and her bedroom. And it really changed the way we thought about it going forward and, and infusing more intentionality into that guest suite that it's not just for a parent who lives there, but for someone in the home who needs to quarantine. So could is there a way to design it so that we could cordon off this section of the home and make it safe? Or if you have a someone coming to stay with you, is this a place where they could quarantine for the recommended period of time, but with these doors where you could actually still talk to them and they could be outside and they have their own outside space. And I love this level of um, expanded um, definition of these of these guest suites on the first floor that are much more uh, flexible to different scenarios and, and accommodating to really serious needs for people. The family entry and the, and the guest entry and the distinction between the two is is super fascinating to me because, because they're so very different. They function so differently. And, and the family entry, really, we're taking it from the drop zone to that's where the extra refrigerator is. That's where the extra, maybe the laundry is relocated there or there's an additional laundry there so that if you are a frontline worker, you're coming home and you're actually just kind of getting naked like, here you go, <laughs> here's my clothes, here's my robe, or, or there's a bathroom, a full bath attached, and there's a laundry sink there, so you can wash your hands in the laundry sink, but there's also an opportunity in the adjacent powder or full bath where the other kid is washing their hands. Like, there is this, there's a sequence that we're reflecting in the space of decontamination into the home, so that these are really high-functioning areas that are intuitive, they have all the things that we need, a place for the backpack, a place for the shoes. For my family, it's sports equipment. There's lacrosse equipment everywhere in my house, <laughs> but having it, and there's turf all over all of it. If it's not mud, it's turf, but it has to stay somewhere or else it's all over my house. And so, and what I loved about when we designed the concept home were these cutoff junctions yes. of the, you know, the family entry, then there's the, you know, the transition into the shared sacred space of like only the people that live here are in this space or the queue of the vestibule where you could have a, a door behind you, but still have a, a safe zone of, you know, conversing with a neighbor or someone that you're bubbled or, you know, having the door open, but not having them inside that space where, you know, a high traffic space like your kitchen or something like that. So the, we've totally reimagined these spaces for decontamination if you need to, washing your hands quickly, but cueing all of us to what we need to do and how we need to arrive at home and how we need to welcome our guests and then how we need to maybe separate from, uh, from the, uh, the people in our home to keep everybody safe. Awesome, like well said, Elena, and really, um, I think really thoughtful and intentional. So now is the time for how might we? I think there might be some questions. If not, I hope they'll come up now. I'll stop sharing and let's talk. Anybody have any questions or comments they wanna share? Please feel free. I've got a, I've got a, a comment. Great, hi, Bill. Hi, everybody. Um, can you, uh, well, I was going to ask if you could put up the the drawing of the outdoor spaces, but then that would get in the way of everybody seeing everybody. But I was struck by the fact that the drawing shows the you know the outdoor space, the private outdoor space in either the front or the back. And I 
there's an opportunity that we're missing a lot and that's the side yard. Mm -hmm. uh, a it's lot of us over the years have spent a lot of time figuring out how to use the side yards to generate usable space that can also be private if the house next door is designed accordingly. I haven't seen that much in conventional single family detached, although I have seen it in a couple of, of projects right here in Irvine in, uh, in uh, Parkside, Lennar did one where they put a, a really big box on a small lot mm -hmm. and, and the backyard was so shallow that there really wasn't any usable. I mean, it was barely usable. So they carved out a corner of the box, wrapped the yard around and picked up the side yard. So they had 10 feet coming in from one side, 10 feet coming in from the other side. And then they had the outdoor space carved out. Now we've done that a lot on alley loads and clusters over the years, and it works out great, but I'm surprised that more people aren't picking up on that notion of You're utilizing right. the side yard. You're absolutely right, Bill. It is a great opportunity. And what popped into my mind of the pictures is the, the picture of the kitchen with the banquette and the table. If you saw to the right, there's a big glass door. That's the great way to carve out that space, let all that light into your kitchen and your in-house eating area. No, that's a very good point. Carving out space in the middle is important because you can let light in on three sides. Exactly. And the other thing is, if you've got two five foot side yards, that's 10 feet. It is, yeah. And if you notch out of the house two or three feet, now you've got an outdoor room. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah really uh, see what Elaine is going to do on the concept home for the side slash backyard there. It's very cool. Yeah. It's notched it's out, cool. just like you said. It's it's kind of, it's notched out to, to make use of that side yard. And I think it's so important to have a plan like that that's complemented with a more traditional plan so that if the house, so the home next door is using a different part of the yard than, than, than the other home so that you are creating more opportunities for privacy just by offering different, offsetting them. different yeah. home types. Yeah, but that middle part is really important. And we, we've had a plan, not in front load, but in alley load, like you say, so that we can kind of shift the, how the house wraps around either the middle or the back or the front. And, yeah. then, and then we're playing with those to create moments of privacy for the, for the home buyer. Well, I'm, I'm also struck by the fact that even in really pricey houses, your neighbor is typically 10 feet away and you're looking right into his bedroom window from your bedroom window. Uh, yeah. Or, to <laughs> or your dining room window is five feet from his wall and his Rottweiler is running back and forth in the side yard right outside your dining room yeah or in my case standard poodle but yeah, yeah and bill that comes down to like really lot by lot sighting of home plans right well, so, and, and it's and it's also designing the homes so they work together they've all got to they've got to line up and work together as opposed to just putting any house you want to on any lot that's exactly right <clears throat> yep for sure lot by lot sighting and you know, we talk a lot about how in, in homes now today with all these requirements around flexibility, work from home, life from home, school from home, how every inch matters. Well, every inch matters outside too. I mean, exactly. more than ever, when the cost of land, especially in our markets is what it is, every inch matters. Yeah. For sure. in, in defense in defense of builders, not that you're attacking builders, but it is hard to say no to a sale. <laughs> when you need a sale and they want to build the house that you hadn't envisioned for that lot. Yep. You're I like, agree. well, let me, let me, how, how well can I disclaim this? <laughs> explain the original vision, but do you get all, some, you know, and sometimes, sometimes we say, okay, like if you're, you know, this wasn't well, what we intended, but okay. But well, it, you're well, the right. Thing, it's hard. The thing is, the thing is though, the houses can be designed so that they all work together. I mean, you could have three plans, all of which work together depending on how they're flipped. Yes. Uh, but, if but they're single, you story, always find out the, the way that they 
don't exactly line up by the customer who wants to buy it. I feel like that's how I, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't designed it perfectly yet, but I hope to. <laughs> Other comments or questions or um, re requests or insights or how made you go, huh? Anything from anybody? If I, if I may, my name is Jim Hollis. I work with Ran at Rancho Michoacan with Chris Maher. And uh, we're, th all of this was so insightful um, because it's exactly what we're dealing with right now as we're planning our future phases. But, and I appreciate the, the all the feedback. Bill brought up a good point. I think you, you mentioned this, at least your sketch kind of shows that, but that indoor outdoor relationship too with the front or the side, however that is, we're seeing some really cool designs come across the table where they're taking that flex space in the front but open, you know, the front of the house, but opening it up to the outside and creating space, that usable space outside. But in my neighborhood where I live, it's an older neighborhood. It was built in the late seventies. Everyone's converting their front yards to where they have these outdoors patio spaces and people live on the street. They even have televisions on, <laughs> on their patio spaces outside. It's this amazing usable space. And then the people in their garages have converted their garages into bars. Yeah. So in my neighborhood, almost every other street has a bar inside their garage. <laughs> and this outdoors, this indoor outdoor relationship now is created where everyone's living on the street. It's really fun. It's that a fun experience. Cool. That is so cool. You know, I remember Willowsford in on the <laughs> East Coast in DC years and years ago. Remember Christy Yule, Gina lived in yeah. Willowsford and she told me Jim's stories of, you know, Friday night block parties in their alley and people would roll up their garage doors and there'd be a bar and a barbecue and the one next door and yeah I mean what an opportunity right we can be so much more flexible people are living that way now yeah we call it Tuesday night street drinks I, and Jim <laughs> I live in Rancho Mission Viejo I'm on the ranch okay. and so yeah, Tuesday yeah. nights everyone's out there street yeah, drinks that's... on Tuesday night just to make sure you have like a face check right everyone wants exactly. to make sure everybody's okay and you know, yeah, it's a Tuesday night because I'm one of the only people still working, but <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> no, it's great. But, but I, know, I love it's the just nice that it's really that neighborhood feel where everyone wants to make sure people, you know, have that check in. Exactly. Yeah. But I and I do appreciate the RV comment. I'm working in my what I call my ADU in my side yard and my or in my backyard. This is my trailer that I'm working from where I get my peace and quiet. So it's yeah. uh your ADUs will certainly see more of that. And it, now I'm exactly. thinking that my imagery needs to include a garage as a bar. I'm going to go yeah. back. And yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna put that in the option set. So yeah. all <laughs> yeah. I love it. Great comment, Jim. I love it. And, I, and, you know, you just make us all think that, again, every inch matters. And just think about how people live. I mean, how do you live? What matters to you, right? That's what matters to our buyers. Same deal. Great comment. Well, I can't thank you enough, panel, for sharing your insights and bringing us together. I, I, again, it's so wonderful to see everyone's faces. I'm so missing being able to get that big hug from everybody. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not alone, but uh, I um, can't thank you enough. This has been wonderful. And I speak on behalf of the whole Council of Sage and just sharing our appreciation um, and saying thank you. Oh, you're thank, welcome. thank you for having us. It's a great to see everybody. Be well, everybody. Be strong. Do the best you can in every single thing. <laughs> Bye, Great guys. Great job, you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Mel. Awesome. Good, Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>